Hello and welcome to this GCSE chemistry video about the properties of ionic compounds. In this video, we'll start by looking at what ionic compounds are and how they are arranged in a three-dimensional ionic lattice. And then we'll focus in on two really important properties of ionic compounds. Firstly, their melting and boiling point, And secondly, their electrical conductivity. Ions are charged particles, and they are formed when electrons are transferred between atoms. Ionic compounds are made up of oppositely charged ions. And so we will have positive ions that have been formed because they have lost negative electrons, and there will be negative ions, and these have been formed because those atoms gained negative electrons to become negatively charged ions. The ions in an ionic compound are held together by strong electrostatic forces of attraction, which is a very complicated sounding phrase, and it's a very important phrase. So let's unpick it. The word electrostatic means that we are referring to positively and negatively charged particles. In this case, we are talking about the ions that are positively and negatively charged. It's an attractive force, and so that means it is holding those ions together. And I'm showing that here with red lines to show that attractive force. You wouldn't need to draw that in an exam. And they're strong electrostatic forces of attraction, and that means that a lot of energy would be needed to break them. And it is this strong electrostatic force of attraction that is the ionic bond. It is the force that holds the ions together. An ionic compound is actually a giant structure of ions, sometimes referred to as a three-dimensional ionic lattice. And the word giant is referring to the fact that we don't just have one positive ion and one negative ion, we've actually got a huge number of ions. And the word lattice is referring to the fact that we have got a regular repeating pattern throughout the structure. There are two main ways of showing the lattice structure of an ionic compound, and I think the best way to demonstrate them is to gradually build them up. And so if we start with a two-dimensional slice through an ionic compound, you can see that we've got alternating positive and negative ions in a regular pattern. And the electrostatic forces of attraction between these oppositely charged ions will be acting in all dimensions. And so you can see that this ion here has got four oppositely charged ions around it in that same plane in two dimensions. And if we gradually introduce another layer, and another layer, and another layer, you can see that this pattern doesn't just repeat in two dimensions, it repeats in three dimensions as well. And so every ion will actually have six oppositely charged neighbours, and those electrostatic forces of attraction will be between that ion and all six of its neighbours. And so they are acting in all directions. And the arrangement of ions that I'm showing here will continue in all directions as well. I'm just showing a small sample of a three-dimensional lattice, sodium chloride, which is the only lattice that you need to be able to identify and recognise, would have billions and billions of ions in it. I'm just showing a small snapshot of that lattice structure. Another way to show the lattice structure is to have a cube marked out by lines and to have each of the oppositely charged ions at the points where the lines meet. And so you can see that the two different structures do look similar. They have in common the fact that they have both got different particles. What's different in the second one is that the charges aren't shown, but I have included a key showing that the blue ions are the positive sodium ions, Na+, and the yellow circles are representing the chloride ions, Cl-. Both of these diagrams are showing the lattice structure of sodium chloride, but in slightly different ways. And you need to be able to recognise diagrams like these as showing ionic compounds, and the big clues are, of course, the positive and negative charges, either shown on the ions themselves or in the key. 
Particle theory can be used to help explain changes of state. The particles in a solid are held together in ordered rows and a regular pattern, and the particles are not free to move around, only to vibrate about a fixed position. And this is because there are strong forces between the particles holding them in that fixed position. In order to turn a substance from a solid into a liquid, these forces need to be overcome or at least weakened. And so energy needs to be put in for this to happen. And this energy is only supplied once a substance reaches its melting point. Once a substance has been turned from a solid into a liquid, there are still forces between those particles, but they are weaker than previously, which is why the particle arrangement for a liquid is much more disordered and more random than it is for a solid. Breaking these forces is necessary to convert a liquid into a gas, because once a liquid has turned into a gas, those particles have actually got no forces between them. And that's why the gas particles are arranged entirely randomly and entirely separately, and they're very disorganised. And the energy required to convert a liquid into a gas is supplied once a material reaches its boiling point. The amount of energy needed to change state from solid to liquid and liquid to gas will depend on the strength of the forces between the particles. And the type of substance itself, so that means its structure or its bonding, will affect the type of particle a substance is made up of. And so this could mean we're talking about molecules or we could be talking about ions in a lattice. And this will affect the type of force between the particles of that substance and the strength of these forces. A useful generalisation to keep in mind is that the stronger the forces between particles, the harder they will be to separate. And so the higher the melting and boiling points will be for that substance. Melting an ionic compound involves separating the ions away from their neighbouring ions in the three-dimensional giant ionic lattice. Remember that the ions are held together by strong electrostatic forces of attraction. And these forces are present whether a compound is a solid or a liquid. As a solid, these attractions are particularly strong because the particles are especially close. And remember that these electrostatic attractions act in all dimensions. And so that means that each negative ion, for instance, will have six positively charged neighbours. And there are billions and billions of oppositely charged ions in this three-dimensional ionic lattice. And so large amounts of energy are needed to break the many strong ionic bonds and separate out those ions. And as a result of this, ionic compounds have high melting points and high boiling points. So they only change from a solid to a liquid at a high temperature and a liquid to a gas at an even higher temperature. Electric current is the flow of charged particles. To conduct electricity, the charged particles must be free to move. So for a material to be a conductor of electricity, it needs to contain charged particles in its structure and those charged particles must be free to move. Ionic compounds are made up of charged particles, the positive and the negative ions, but as a solid, these ions are held in fixed positions in the three-dimensional giant ionic lattice, and so therefore they are not free to move around, only to vibrate about those fixed positions, and therefore ionic compounds do not conduct electricity as a solid. So if we connected a circuit with a power supply and a bulb and connected it up as I'm showing here with a gap in the circuit and then we put a material into that gap to try to complete the circuit, we could prove whether the material was an electrical conductor or not. 
If we were to fill the gap in the circuit with a solid ionic material, the bulb would not light up since the ions in the 3D lattice are not able to move and so no electric current can flow. Electric current is the flow of charged particles. And so to conduct electricity, a substance needs to have charged particles in its structure and those particles must be free to move. Ionic compounds, which are made up of positive and negatively charged ions, do not conduct electricity as a solid. However, when melted or dissolved in water, the forces between the ions have been weakened and they are no longer held in the rigid, solid, three-dimensional, giant ionic lattice. And so therefore now they are free to move around as a liquid ionic substance or as a solution. And so this means that now the charged particles can flow and the ions would move in a particular direction and conduct electricity. And so therefore, ionic compounds do conduct electricity when melted, that means when they are a liquid, or when they are dissolved in water. And we might say that they are in solution. And so if we had the same circuit as before, but this time the electrodes were dipped into a molten ionic substance or a solution of sodium chloride, for instance, dissolved in water, the bulb would light up. And this is because the charged particles, those ions, are moving through the solution towards their oppositely charged electrode. And this property is what enables ionic substances to act as electrolytes during electrolysis because ionic substances do conduct electricity when the compound is melted or dissolved in water. Okay, that's the end of this video. Thanks for listening.